I was about to pull out my tablet. Good morning. Welcome to Adult Forum. Oh, wait, we're, we're still, still talking in here. We've got to get you. Uh, <laughs> Hello, everyone. Our, our speakers are both online this morning. So um, now I think Nelson, we've stopped talking in this room. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Welcome to Adult Forum. We're happy to begin our fall season. Uh, Elizabeth Schrader Pulser is, Pulser is a doctoral student in early Christianity here at Duke. And she has been focusing on new textual criticism and the New Testament and the role of Mary Magdalene and details in the Gospel of John. And while she's not yet faculty, she's already published in the Harvard Theological Review, the Journal of Biblical Literature, a journal of uh, TC, a journal of biblical textual criticism. And those articles have been notorious enough that they've been written about in the National Catholic Reporter, Religion News Service, Daily Beast, among other places. And so we're very pleased today for her to give us an introduction to New Testament textual criticism. Welcome. Thank you so much, Nelson. Um, I wanted to apologize in advance because my cat is, is right in the way and I'm trying to make sure she's less so. And there's also a dog in the room. So if there's any pet antics that interrupt, I apologize in advance. Um, at least they're very cute. <laughs> Uh, okay, she seems okay on the bed now. All right. So, um, uh, yeah, as Nelson said, I'm a, my name is Elizabeth Schrader Pulitzer. I'm now a, an early Christianity ABD candidate at, uh, in the religion department here at Duke. And um, I'm happy to just sort of, uh, so when Nelson and I were talking about this, we were trying to figure out how to frame the discussion. And we decided we were going to do three weeks in a row. Um, and so this first week, I'm just going to give you an introduction to New Testament textual criticism. Um, next week, I'm going to be talking about John 11, which is where a lot of the attention has gone, um, the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead and some instability around Martha's presence in the manuscripts. Um, and then uh, week three, I'll be talking about a textual problem in John 20 uh, in the interaction between Jesus and Mary Magdalene in the garden. So that's sort of the plan. And um, I'm just going to talk. I, I'm hoping it's going to take about 40 minutes to talk. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions. Um, and I'm guessing that, sorry, Maddie. Oh. <laughs> sorry, not that. I'm guessing that uh, there'll be some time to field uh, questions and Nelson. And, and sorry, who's the person in charge in uh, Westbrook? There's a woman in charge there. Uh, that was Reverend Carol, Carol Gregg, but I don't, she may not be able to be there for the entire time. Right. So maybe, well, many uh, thanks to the, Many thanks to Nelson and to Reverend Greg for allowing me to give this information to your congregation. I look forward to chatting with everyone. So let me get started by sharing my screen. Um, introduction to New Testament textual criticism. There we go. So um, what is textual criticism? Maybe some of you have heard of it. Maybe some of you have not. Um, most Christians are not aware or don't think about the fact that the autographs of the New Testament, that is the author's copies, have not survived. All that remain are handwritten copies of copies, and there are tens of thousands of them. So um, no two handwritten copies are exactly alike. Maybe that's ex to be expected. I don't know. Um, but uh, due to scribal error, Sometimes copyists have to correct their text. So it's the work of New Testament textual criticism to wade through these tens of thousands of manuscripts that don't all match and to try to figure out what, what the right reading is or what the earliest reading is, as we're going to find out later in the talk. So um, with the exception of perhaps one small fragment of John 18 that is called Papyrus 52, at least a hundred years passed between the composition of the books of the New Testament and all of our surviving manuscripts. So maybe this one is dated to 150 AD, maybe 200 AD, 
the Gospel of John usually is thought to have written at the end of the first century. Some people think the beginning of the second century. So maybe this small fragment, this small scrap of papyrus is dated to within a hundred years of the author of the um, composition of the Gospel of John, maybe. But maybe it's over a hundred years after the composition of the Gospel of John. And this is the only one that's even close to being that early. Um, so generally there's at least a hundred years between whatever the author wrote and the earliest copy. So there's all what I call, that's, I, I call it sort of like a black box in between the author's writing and the oldest that we can get back to. And so we're not actually sure what happened to the text in that hundred to 200 years in between what the author wrote and the earliest copy that we have. Nearly all of these earliest manuscripts, including Papyrus 52, were discovered in Egypt in the 20th century. Um, and after Papyrus 52, our copies get a little bit more substantial. Papyrus 66, which is usually dated to 200 AD, but some people think third century, um, is the oldest near complete copy we have of any gospel. And it contains just the Gospel of John. We're going to be talking a lot more about Papyrus 66 next week. Um, it's held at the Bodmer Library in Cologne, Switzerland. And there's a couple pieces at the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin, Ireland. There's over 450 corrections made to the text. So the scribe is copying it and then changing and correcting. Um, so, and that's the oldest copy that we have. So of, of John's gospel, that's an interesting one. Um, papyrus, oops, sorry. I meant to show Papyrus 46, but I don't have a picture of it. It's the oldest copy of the letters of Paul. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then of course, there's the books of the Old Testament that have an even more obscure history. Of course, does anybody know what the oldest copies of the Hebrew Bible are? I'm guessing you know. They are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's right. Thank you, John. Um, so those it's ones. Christian, I go by. Oh, Christian. Sorry. Christian. Yeah. Um, it's okay. Yeah. And I'm a ringer. I'm a, I'm a PhD, Duke PhD in New Testament. Oh, fantastic. So, fantastic. Uh, so you, you know all this. Yeah. So the Dead yeah, Sea and Scrolls. I have fun. Did you have you, did you get a chance to take Bart Ehrman's course on uh, text criticism? Um, I took Eldon Epps' course on textual criticism. Oh, at well, Harvard yeah, School, okay. But um, I have taken a course with with Bart. Yes, um, that was more on early Christian apocrypha. Um, okay. well, so, uh, yeah, Bart is on my committee. Don't worry, Bart's got his eye on me. Bart Bart Ehrman is on my committee, and we'll talk about Bart as the as the presentation goes on. So, um, okay. as Christian, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go yeah, ahead. That's all right. So, as Christian said, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls are the oldest. Uh, copies of the Hebrew Bible, and they were copied 500 to 900 years after the Old Testament books were written. So there's these blank spots, these black boxes in the text transmission of all parts of the Bible, and we can't actually be sure what happened to the text in those time periods. We also know that very few people were literate in the first and second centuries. Many stories about Jesus were instead being memorized and performed orally at that time. Such oral performances were in fact widespread when scribes were copying these earliest copies of the Gospels, and most modern scholars believe that there was interaction between the oral stories that were being told about Jesus and the earliest copies and the written stories about Jesus that were handed down to us. The oral performances might have occasionally affected the way that the evangelists' written stories appear. So let's talk about the, poss the possibility of like an oral story possibly having something to do with our um, with our oldest copies. So staying here in Papyrus 66, um, perhaps you know the story of the woman caught in adultery, which is in, in your Bible, it'll appear in John chapter 7, 53 through 8, 11. So maybe some of you know, probably Christian knows, that um, in the oldest copies of John, this, this, this story is not there. Um, and this is Papyrus 66, the oldest copy of John 8. And you can see right here, that that entire chunk of story is not there. The text immediately goes from search the scriptures and see that the prophet does not come from Galilee to immediately after that, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. So this, the whole story is not there. In fact, no known biblical manuscript before the fifth century has that story of the woman caught in, in adultery. Uh, this, is, this is the story, you know, let he who is without sin cast the first stone um, where Jesus sort of intercedes on behalf of this adulteress that is about to be stoned. Um, so let's look at another one, uh, Codex Sinaiticus. This is a... Interrupt, interrupt. I'm sorry? 
if, if you'll pardon another interruption. Sure. I think some of us know that the there were no punctuation marks in, in Old Hebrew. So is that dot highly unusual? Do you mean Old Greek, ancient Greek or ancient uh, Hebrew? In manuscripts of this time, mm. there, was not, there was not punctuation, I thought. There's there's not there's not generally punctuation. Papyrus sixty six actually has a lot of punctuation marks in the um, the Last Supper, uh, which suggests that in that specific portion of Papyrus sixty six, it was read aloud, um, and actually maybe used in liturgy. So there's like little teeny parts, but in general, and you can also see there's like a little punctuation mark here, and sometimes there's dots sort of in between sections. Some people, I would say people who are not that, um, uh, not the most trained text critics would try to argue that this dot is telling you that the, that the story of the woman caught in adultery was removed from Papyrus 66. But if you look throughout Papyrus 66, these dots usually indicate, okay, like there's a break in the story or like a, you know, it's just sort of like, it's sort of like a pause. There are some teeny small punctuation marks that you find. But there's not, see, there's another one here in Codex Semioticus, right? But they're, they're usually just sort of like paragraph breaks. You could kind of, you could, um, you could uh, describe them that way. But as you can see here in Codex Semioticus, which is the fourth century, not much punctuation going on. Occasionally these little dots, or maybe it's sort of the ends of sentences or places where people would pause. Um, but it's not really a punctuation mark. Um, so uh, let's see here. So here in Codex Sinaiticus, if you want to go to codexsinaiticus.org, you can find out more about this extremely wonderful manuscript. It's fourth century. Again, the story of the woman caught in adultery is not there. And here we've got this nice English translation. You can see again, out of Galilee, a prophet arises not. Again, Jesus said to them saying, I am the light of the world. So we get the same thing. It's and the dot is actually in the same place. Um, where there's no story of the woman caught in adultery. So sometimes this story even shows up at the end of the Gospel of John. Um, Duke actually has a manuscript where this is the case. This is the very last leaf of Duke Greek manuscript number six, which is copied in the 11th century. And you can see it's the very last uh, page of this Gospel manuscript, <clears throat> and it appears at the very end. It's not, just like Codex Sinaiticus, it's not there in the story uh, in John seven and eight, but you do see it at the very end of the manuscript. So the scribe sort of, it's got this sort of liminal status where you recognize, okay, this maybe this story should be in our gospel, but I don't know where to put it. So they just put it there at the end. It also shows up sometimes in the gospel of Luke. In minuscule 124, Jesus is, it's a different story of Jesus in the temple. It's in Luke's gospel. So it says every day he was teaching in the temple at night, he would go out and spend the night on the Mount of Olives. All the people would get up early in the morning to listen to him in the temple. And then you see John 7, 53 here. And then we get this story about the scribes and the Pharisees bringing a woman who's been caught in adultery. Oh my gosh. All right. So the story of the woman caught in adultery in for this 11th century copyist congregation, the story of the woman caught in adultery was in the gospel of Luke, not in the gospel of John. For this 11th century uh, copyist and congregation, it wasn't in the Gospel of John, but it was at the end of the manuscript. For this fourth century copyist, it wasn't there at all. All right, so it's for reasons like these that most biblical scholars no longer believe that the story of the woman caught in adultery was written by the author of the fourth gospel. Um, for a more uh, detailed treatment of this, I'm gonna recommend my advisor's monograph. My advisor is Jennifer Knuse. She has a whole book on this called To Cast the First Stone, co-written with Tommy Wasserman. And they sort of make the argument that um, it could have come from a book called The Gospel of the Hebrews, which circulated in the second century, third century. And um, we have some church fathers who make reference to the Gospel of the Hebrews and who read it, and they cite it, and it seems to have maybe this story in it. Um, but uh, the Gospel of the Hebrews was not accepted into the biblical canon. And we don't have any copies of the Gospel of the Hebrews. We just have people talking about the Gospel of the Hebrews and referencing this story. It's possible that this particular story was so popular that when the Gospel of Hebrews was suppressed or not accepted into the canon, uh, 
they said, but what about that one story? We like that one story. So this story, they, they try to kind of slip it in to more accepted gospels like Luke or John so that the story itself wouldn't be lost. And the, the words, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, may be a true saying of the historical Jesus. That is absolutely possible. It's also possible that this was, as I was saying, an oral story that was circulating. There are actually a lot of textual variations within the text transmission of the story of the woman caught in adultery. So um, it's possible that this, it was an oral story or it was in the gospel of the Hebrews and it just found its way into early manuscripts um, starting in the fifth century. And then it sort of made its way into the entire text transmission. But because it wasn't probably authored by John, the author of John's gospel, um, many Bible translations like the New Revised Standard Version, which maybe you have, put this story in brackets. It will show up if you're reading your Bible and you're reading your gospel of John, and then you see this story showing up in brackets. You're saying, why are there brackets around this story? Now you know the answer. And that's the sort of editorial decision that, um, these Bible translators have made. They they don't want to put it in the footnotes or get rid of it completely because people love the story so much. That's really the reason why. People would be very upset if you took the story completely out of the Bible. So because it's pervaded the entire text transmission and because it might really be something that actually happened, it might be a true story of Jesus, the solution for many Bible translators is just to keep it there in John's gospel, but put it in brackets to indicate that it was not authored by the fourth evangelist. So another of the most striking differences uh, in our gospel manuscripts is the conclusion of the gospel of Mark. So here we are back at Codex Sinaiticus, that nice fourth century manuscript. The most ancient copies, again, do not mention any resurrection appearance from Jesus, um, the oldest copies we have of the gospel of Mark. Instead, it says that the women fled from the tomb. Terror and amazement had seized them. They said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Bang, that's the end of the gospel. It ends at Mark 16, 8. Um, for early readers of these manuscripts, maybe that seemed like a very awkward and anticlimactic ending. But most of the later manuscripts of Mark do include verses 9 through 20. So this is a 13th century manuscript. Um, this is, these are resurrection stories about Jesus that have probably been influenced by other gospels. So he appeared, when it says he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, that suggests that this person knows John's gospel from whom he had cast out seven demons. That sounds like Luke's gospel. Um, when they heard he was alive, they would not believe it. That again, sounds like Luke's gospel. He appeared to in another form to two of them as they were walking in the country. That sounds like the road to Emmaus, again, Luke's gospel. So this chunk of Mark's gospel verses nine through 20, most people think was maybe authored in the second century by someone who heard those other gospel stories. Um, but it has more satisfying content because the resurrected Jesus actually appears. So the majority of later copyists of Mark's gospel have incorporated the long ending into Mark. Um, there's also a shorter ending of Mark. This is in Codex Babiensis, which is fourth or fifth century. And it has a different ending to Mark's gospel. All that had been commanded to the women, they told briefly to those around Peter. Um, and afterward, Jesus himself sent out from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. So that's a different ending to Mark's gospel. So you can see that there's actually three endings that we know. There's the short ending, the long ending, and the shorter ending. Sorry, the, the, you could say there, there's just the ending at 16.8, the long ending, and the shorter ending. There's actually also the freer gospels, Codex Washingtonianus, which is fifth century, has a different version of the long ending. And there's all these other variations um, of the ending of the Gospel of Mark throughout the text transmission so uh, that I don't need to get into because it's very complex. So these different endings to Mark's Gospel raise an important question. What should readers of the Bible consider to be the correct conclusion of the Gospel of Mark? The style of this short ending is very different from the rest of the Gospel. The long ending shows obvious familiarity with Luke and probably John but it's written, but those were written after the Gospel of Mark, probably. So neither the short nor the long ending can be considered original to the Gospel. Does that mean that Mark's Gospel should end right here at 16.8 with the women fleeing afraid and Jesus doesn't appear? Or do all the endings have value because they give us a window into debates that early Christians were having? Or 
could there have been another more controversial ending to Mark's gospel that was omitted at a stage of the text transmission? Or is it possible that Mark didn't finish his gospel? Maybe he, you know, got sick or something. And, or maybe the end of the scroll, like the last scroll that he wrote was lost. We don't know. The ending of Mark is one of the most uncomfortable questions for those who want to know what the correct text of the Bible really is. So let's look at some more manuscripts of the New Testament. Um, the oldest copies do not reflect the text of what is in your Bible today in other ways sometimes. For example, I was telling you about Papyrus 46, which is the oldest copy of Paul's letters, usually dated around 200 AD. Um, it, uh, according to its codex construction, it does not have First and Second Timothy and Titus known as the pastoral epistles. So this late second century person who's putting together like, okay, I know I found all Paul's letters and I'm going to put them into a book and I'm going to sort of make an edition of Paul, like this is the Paul Codex. Um, these, this person didn't seem to think that first and second Timothy and Titus were authored by Paul, or maybe they didn't even know those letters. Um, there's also Papyrus 72, third or fourth century, where first and second Peter and Jude are bound up with some texts that are certainly not considered biblical today, like the Nativity of Mary from the Protoevangelium of James, an Ode of Solomon, a sermon by Melito of Sardis. Um, so uh, it's possible that this third century person who's putting all these texts together into this codex, it's called the Bodmer Miscellaneous Codex, they did not necessarily think that first and second Peter and Jude had the same level of authority of scripture as they might have given to the epistles of Paul or to the four gospels. They might have said, oh, this has about as much authority, first and second Peter and Jude has about as much authority as the Protoevangelium of James. Or else it's just sort of a miscellaneous codex. It's, it's, you can just see that if you go back to the earliest manuscripts that we have, a lot of things that we take for granted are showing up in unexpected ways in these manuscripts. You're not necessarily seeing what you expect to see. Let's look at some more variations between readings and the manuscripts. Sometimes these variations can come down to a single letter. So let's go back to that exact same picture of Papyrus 66. This is that spot where um, the pericope of the adulteress is not there. There's this really interesting erasure happening here on the very first letter. So um, the scribe originally wrote, this, this letter is an Omicron, um, which is the masculine nominative article. It sounds like ha, and it means the, it means the, in ma it's the masculine form of the. So um, the scribe originally wrote, the prophet does not come from Galilee. But when the, when the scribe erases that letter, um, if there's no definite article, there's no like the, then in Greek, it's just a prophet does not come from Galilee. So it originally said the prophet does not come from Galilee and erases that letter. So it now says a prophet does not come from Galilee. And that's what our Bibles say today. A prophet does not come from Galilee or no prophet comes from Galilee. Papyrus 66 is the only manuscript that has this extra letter. The prophet does not come from Galilee. But this variant is extremely important for understanding the meaning of the text. Um, Jonah, Hosea, and Nahum are three Old Testament prophets that definitely came from Galilee. In John's gospel, could these educated Pharisees somehow not know about, uh, about uh, Nahum, uh, Hosea, and Jonah? That seems kind of unlikely. So this reading actually makes better sense. It would be silly for the Pharisees to say no prophet comes from Galilee because there's three prophets that come from Galilee that they should have known. So this reading actually makes more sense. The prophet, the Jewish Messiah supposedly foretold in Deuteronomy 18.18 18 and Micah 5.2, that would have been a totally different matter for first century Jews. The prophet does, is not supposed to come from Galilee, right? The prophet is supposed to come from Bethlehem. So um, which is the right reading here? The prophet does not come from Galilee, which makes sense theologically and historically, or a prophet does not come from Galilee. Literally, Papyrus 66, I told you there's tens of thousands of manuscripts of the Gospel of John. This is the only manuscript 
where you get that extra letter and it's been erased. So what should, what should we think here? Should we put the original reading of Papyrus 66? It is the oldest, it is the oldest reading that we have, but it's been corrected to match literally thousands, tens of thousands of other manuscripts. So which one should we put in our Bibles? How does this textual variant affect our understanding, our exegesis of what the Pharisees are saying and what is going on in John chapter seven? You see how this is a really hard question. And you know, some scholars argue, this is the right reading and it just fell out of the text transmission. Some people have made that argument. Other people say tens of thousands of manuscripts do not have it. And, that's, and maybe the scribe of Papyrus 66 was thinking, oh, you know, this is dumb. They should definitely be saying the prophet, not a prophet. So maybe the scribe was trying to correct John because John was mistaken, but then said, oh, you know, I shouldn't do that and then erased it. It's, it's, we don't know. You can make an argument either way. So this is a tricky one. Here's another important uh, textual problem. It's, it's called the Johannine comma. This is in 1 John chapter 5. Um, the vast majority of our Greek manuscripts do not have this piece. Uh, there's, there's, there's this extra piece in most Latin manuscripts. It says there are three that testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that testify on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. So this is a 10th century Latin manuscript. You can see that this, it's got the Johannine comma in there. But the oldest manuscripts going back to Codex Sinaiticus, I use this one because it's, it's got it highlighted in red for you. Um, so Codex Sinaiticus, those words are not there. Um, but you will see in early copies, like, sorry, in early uh, printed translations, like the King James Bible, you are going to get these words in there. Um, so the King James Bible was responding to the to sort of the vast majority of what was what was in the Latin manuscripts because people were used to it. And when you read First John, there's this extra part: there are three that testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And then when you go back and you start looking at these old manuscripts, much older manuscripts, you know, fourth century, and it's not there, that was considered sort of disturbing for some early text critics because this is theological. Um, it has to do with the Trinity and saying that the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit are one. So Bible scholars have concluded that these words were probably added by a Latin editor, maybe as early as the fourth century. During that time, which was long after the books of the New Testament had been composed, there were many heated debates happening in Christianity. Anybody that's gotten a divinity degree or certainly a PhD knows that the third and the fourth century, there was massive conversations being had in Christianity about correct doctrine, third, fourth, fifth century. So it is quite possible that a Latin copyist who wanted a portion of scripture that proved the unity and full divinity of all three members of the Trinity, some copyists just decided to add it. Then you can say, oh, look, there is a part of scripture that says that all these three are one and they have equal divinity because that was, I think that was the Council of Constantinople in 381 CE, fourth century. That was like one of those big conversations is the Holy Spirit fully divine, like the Father and the Son. And so when this conversation was happening, it's just easier if you have a manuscript of scripture that says that, even if you're adding it in the fourth century and the letter was written in the first century. So, um, this Latin copyist might have wanted a portion of scripture to prove the unity and full divinity of all three members of the Trinity. And this phrase was accepted into the majority of Latin manuscripts, along with the acceptance of the doctrine of the Trinity. But there is no manuscript evidence for this piece that is called the Johannine comma before the time of the heated debate, right? Codex Sinaiticus was in the fourth century. Um, so most modern text critics think that the words were added later. So it seems to be an attempt to resolve that fourth century debate. So someone might have tried to slip in a later theological doctrine to the New Testament retroactively. So if, feel free to look up the Arian controversy if you want to know more about this, this conversation. But um, do you think that the Johannine comma should be accepted as part of the text of 1 John? Um, most scholars think not. So it's not actually in the brackets. It's not even in the brackets. It's usually in the footnotes. So your NRSV will have this one in the footnotes rather than in brackets in the main text. So that's sort of a survey for you. 
of what textual criticism is and why it matters and how it affects the outcome of our Bibles and how Bibles actually do change over time. The 1611 King James Bible will have the Johannine comma. Your NRSV will not have the Johannine comma because we now have manuscripts like Codex Sinaiticus. This one was discovered in the 19th century um, and Codex Vaticanus where it's just not there. So the text of Bibles does shift over time. Um, in the last quarter century, now textual criticism is a very alive and vibrant field. And just in the last 25 years, New Testament textual criticism has had a marked shift in discussions of the original text of the New Testament. In the 20th century, most text critics assumed that the object of textual criticism is to recover the actual words written by the author. Maybe that's what all of you Maybe that's what seems most obvious to you, most intuitive. What's the point of textual criticism? Well, we're going to recover what the author wrote. But in practice, text critics are often reluctant to, um, to admit that this recovery is not always possible. So Eldon Epp, he's the, the one I took the class with at Harvard, um, he wrote in 1999 this important article called The Multivalence of the Term Original Text in New Testament textual criticism. He actually identifies four different kinds of what we would call original texts. So there's what might be called predecessor text forms. For those of you who are big dorks, you might have heard of Q, which is this theorized source document that Matthew and Luke had access to um, that Mark did not. Um, or else there's supposedly a signs source that maybe the Gospel of John had access to. So these are predecessor text forms that our gospel authors might have had access to. We don't have manuscripts of the Johannine sign source or Q, but we theorize that they exist. But let's say they did exist. Are those the originals? Or is it number two, the autographic text form, like a first edition of John's gospel, which wouldn't have had the pericope, the story of the woman caught in adultery. And also John 21 is often thought not to have been, at, people think that John chapter 21 might have been added later. That's a whole other conversation for people who work on the gospel of John. So maybe the autograph of John's gospel did not include the story of the woman caught in adultery. You, you have seen why. And perhaps it did not include the last chapter. There's also what he calls canonical text forms. So that would include John chapter 21. And depending upon your manuscript, like let's say you've got um, a Codex Beze, which is a, it's copied in about 400 AD. That's, that's their can canonical book of the gospels and acts. And Codex Beze has the pericope of the adulteress. So in the canon for that person in 400 AD, it is a canonical text form. You do have the pericope of the adulteress in that canon. And then there's an interpretive text form as used broadly in the worship of the church. That definitely has the pericope of the adulteress because throughout the millennia, since, I don't know, about 400, 500 AD, Everybody has included the story of the woman caught in adultery. So you can see that different text forms can be considered original. So the story of the woman caught in adultery would not be original here, but it would be original here. Is John 21 the original text? Well, every manuscript that we have of John's gospel has John chapter 21, but the majority of people who work on the gospel of John think that probably the author didn't write it, that it might've been added by the next generation of people in the Johannine community if you even believe such a community existed. So that's like, which is, which is original? Is John 21 original to the Gospel of John or is it not? These are, these are the, so basically what Eldon Epp was pointing out in 1999 is we pretend like we're trying to find the original text, but really people know that we can't, we don't actually, we can't actually find it with certainty. Um, and then especially that question of like the Omicron in John chapter seven, I think it's John 7 52 does the prophet come from Galilee or does a prophet come from Galilee what's the autograph there we just don't know it's it's so he's basically saying um that we we have to sort we can't assert or pretend to let the guild of new testament scholars think that we actually can recover the author what they wrote because we don't have the autographs we can't always be certain what they wrote so um, here then along came uh, Bart Ehrman and David Parker. They sort of were catalysts for Epps article. Bart Ehrman is at UNC. David Parker is at the University of Birmingham. 
Um, they both had very influential monographs. In 1993, uh, Professor Ehrman wrote The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. And um, David Parker wrote in 1997 a book called The Living Text of the Gospels. And um, both of these books are considered to be in the genre of narrative textual criticism. So Ehrman's monograph raised awareness of early modifications to the New Testament based on uh, polemical disputes that were happening, sort of like the, comma, the, the Johannine comma. Um, those were the kind of debates that might have affected the transmission and the copying of scripture. In 1997, David Parker suggested that we should think of the text of the New Testament as always living, always changing according to the needs of the church. So our desire for an original text should maybe be abandoned. Parker, this is Parker's sort of famous line from the living text of the Gospels. The manuscripts are not only the transmitters of the tradition. The manuscripts are the tradition. The manuscripts are the text of the New Testament. There's not this sort of um, archetype in the sky that we're trying to attain. Literally what we have is the manuscripts and they're different from one another. So the text lives and changes over the, the centuries is what Parker was saying. So with this dawning realization that the idea of recovering the original text is actually, it's unattainable and it's now thought to be somewhat ill-conceived. I know that might seem surprising to people but that is the state of the conversation right now in the text critical guild. Um, so text critics have searched for a new baseline text that they can compare to later textual traditions because they realize that the congregations of the world need scripture. So how can we deliver a sort of a baseline text to the churches of the world that need scripture? So today, text critics focus on something that is called the Ausgangstext. Uh, in Germany, um, at, at the, uh, the, there's an institute in Münster, the INTF, I'm not going to try to say it in German. Uh, it's like the Institute for New Testament, like Forschung, uh, the INTF, um, for the Institute for New Testament Research. They're, they're sort of the group that is in charge of um, the Nestle Elan Critical Edition. And they, uh, they today don't seek the original text, they seek the initial circulating text. So um, here's some, here's how Eldon Epp tries to describe it. This is his sort of updated definition of what text critics are doing. New Testament textual criticism employing aspects of both science and art studies the transmission of the New Testament text and the manuscripts that facilitate its transmission with the unitary goal of establishing the earliest attainable text. And that's going to serve as the baseline, the earliest attainable text. That's different than the original text. It's just how far can we get back? At the same time, we are assessing the textual variants that emerge from that baseline text so that we can hear the narratives of early Christian thought and the life that in here in the array of meaningful variants. Sorry for my cat. So um, he's sort of saying this is what we should be thinking about. We're going to try to find the earliest attainable text, but we're also going to be paying attention to stuff like the pericope of the adulteress, the different endings of Mark and the, the, the Johannine comma, because they tell us about early Christian thought and the life of the church. Um, Michael Holmes is another important text critic um, who is part of the New Revised Standard Version uh, Committee. He says that this concept of the initial circulating text or the Ausgangs text, it is empirically grounded because it seeks to determine the archetypes from which our evidence derives, but it's also open-ended. We, we could try to move beyond the archetype to the initial text and so, so we're not trying to like find the, the original, but we're, we're moving to this initial, to as far back as we can get. And so it leaves open the question of what the relationship is between the earliest text we can get to and any early, earlier forms that there are. So this, <clears throat> this initial text is fluid and we're okay with that. We're gonna do our best to go back as far as we can and maybe we can get back a little further and maybe we can get back a little further, but it's okay that that's sort of changing. We don't, we aren't going to pretend like we can actually get to the oldest text. But we still, but we, if we go back further and further, this earliest version can still serve the interests and purposes <clears throat> of a variety of perspectives and approaches. Um, so uh, this understanding of initial text or Ausgangs text is the goal of your Nestle Aland Novum Testamentum Graeche. <clears throat> With, for those of you who went to divinity school, you might have had this, you might have had this uh, critical edition. 
that's the Greek critical text from which most Bibles are translated. So text critics do have to make final decisions about how the Greek text is going to be provided to their translators. And what you should just be aware of is that sometimes new discoveries might actually shift the text or possibly the apparatus. Um, those of you who have one of these, this, this is sort of what is considered to be the initial text. And this is the part that gets translated into Bibles. But then there's sort of footnotes with textual variants that indicate the multiplicity, the multiplicity found in the earliest manuscripts. So how are we doing on time? Um, we're at, do I have a couple more minutes or should I? I have a couple more things I could say, but it's. Um, oh, say them. You've got uh, 17, 18 minutes. OK, because I want to have time for discussion as well. Oh, yeah. Good. But let me. Um, OK, so I'll just go in a little bit also into the versions, which are important. So, um, well, actually, ancient Greek manuscripts are not the only places that text critics can look to find out about the New Testament. There are some really important second, third, and fourth century church fathers who wrote prolific commentaries and sermons about sacred scriptures. Justin Martyr, Irenaeus of Lyon, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian of Carthage, Origen of Alexandria, Eusebius of Caesarea, John Chrysostom. For those of you who went to divinity school, you might know those names. They're not as widely known as the gospel writers, but they were tremendously influential in the eventual formation of the biblical canon and in how Christians have ended up interpreting the New Testament. So these church fathers, their writings are directly, uh, they often are citing their biblical text as they write. But strangely, sometimes a church fathers, the way that they quote the text does not match the text of the Bible as it has come down to us. So this is an example I often cite, which will be directly relevant for our conversation next week. Tertullian of Carthage, who's very old church father, uh, not old as a guy, but old like a long time ago. In around 210 AD, he wrote against Praxius, which was sort of a um, an apology against a guy named Praxius who didn't think Christianity was good. So he says, Mary confessing Jesus to be the son of God. Um, every manuscript of against Praxius has the word Mary here. But um, in your Bible and all the manuscripts of John says that Martha said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, the one coming into the world. Um, so every since every manuscript of against Praxius says Mary here, those who have edited this say, oh, well, Tertullian seems to think that Mary gave the confession. But every gospel manuscript says that it's Martha. So which one do we pay attention to? Which one, and we'll talk more about this next week, but you can see that it's little sort of glitches like this in the text transmission that raise the question. Well, you know, Tertullian was writing, you know, 75 to 100 years before the oldest copy that we have of this story. Um, or sorry, no, around the same time. He's writing around the same time as Papyrus 66. He's writing around the same time as the oldest copy that we have. And his version of the story says something different than what the entire text transmission says. So do we give weight to what Tertullian said? Or do we give weight to the tens of thousands of manuscripts? It's sort of similar to this question of the ha prophetes, do we say the prophet or a prophet? Like, do we give more weight to the oldest thing that we have? And also maybe Tertullian just, his, he had a slip of his memory. Maybe Tertullian just remembered it wrong, right? But it's still the oldest one that we have. Well, that's what's the it. oldest manuscript of Tertullian? Well, those are medieval. Yes, the oldest manuscripts are indeed medieval, which makes it even stranger. It's even stranger because you would think that s someone copying in the medieval era would know that Martha's the one that gives the confession. So the fact that literally every single manuscript of Tertullian says Mary suggests that Tertullian probably wrote Mary. And so that's why the editor says, you know, it seems that maybe Tertullian thought that Mary gave the confession, but that's weird. That doesn't make any sense. We don't have any manuscripts that say that. So this is, these are the sorts of questions that are raised by church fathers. Um, so which is more trustworthy, the, con the consensus of thousands of manuscripts or Tertullian's ancient version of the story? Should we give weight to what Tertullian wrote or should we just say, oh, his, he had a slip of the memory? This is just one of dozens of examples of strange things that church fathers say that don't match what our Bible says. Um, text critics also pay attention, not just to church fathers quotations, but also to the versions 
Um, that is translations into Old Latin, Old Syriac, and Coptic, because of course the New Testament was written in Greek. But we've got very old copies going back to the third and fourth century of Latin, Syriac, and Coptic copies, okay? So some of you might know that in the fourth century, St. Jerome was commissioned by Pope Damasus to make uh, a standard Latin translation of the Bible, and that came to be known as the Vulgate. So he was translating both the Hebrew and Greek copies into Latin, and that became the standard translation of the Catholic Church for over a thousand years. But before Jerome did that, there were, um, you know, Jesus was a popular guy, and people were translating the Bible from Greek. They were translating the New Testament and the stories about Jesus from Greek into Latin for a couple of centuries before Jerome did his translation. So in the second century, somebody was copying, but they were translating the Greek into the Latin. They weren't as erudite as a scholar as St. Jerome was, but there were these translations that were made based on second and third century copies. So um, they, they would be superseded by Jerome's Vulgate, but even today we still have about two dozen gospel books that survive in the old Latin. So these manuscripts, they are Latin translations of second and third century Greek copies. <clears throat> they display differences from Jerome's later Vulgate translation. So again, which do we pay more attention to? So this, let's say that you have an old Latin manuscript um, that, that, that says something different from what your Greek text does. We'll talk again more about this next week. You can say, well, it's a translation and the person was not very erudite. But the thing is, is that whoever that translator was, they had a second century Greek copy in front of them, which we don't have. We don't have any second century Greek copies of the gospel. And this Latin translator did. So the old, whatever they translate into old Latin that's copied into these old Latin books and transmitted for a little while, Sometimes text critics say we really have to pay attention to what the old Latin is because they've got a second century Greek copy in front of them. But again, which which do you pay more attention to the, the the you know the what the Greek copies say because that was the language of composition or what this Latin copy says that maybe the Latin copy is from the 4th century but the translation was done in the 2nd century when there was a 2nd century copy that is lost to us. You can see how it's complex. Um there's also a really important fourth century manuscript of the gospels called the Syriac Sinaitic Palimpsest. And there's a wonderful book about the discovery of it and the translation by a Duke professor, Janet Soskis. I highly recommend this book, The Sisters of Sinai. And it talks about this incredible manuscript, which again, probably the translation was done in the second or the third century. The copy itself is the fourth century, but there might be older readings retained in this Syriac copy of the Gospels, even though it was translated from the Greek. And so sometimes um, text critics have to pay attention to what the Syriac and the Old Latin and the Old Coptic say when they're trying to figure out what that initial circulating text was. So even though these versional manuscripts were not written in the original language, they do occasionally preserve an older version of the Gospel text than even our oldest surviving manuscripts. So. Overall, I want to emphasize to you, I hope this hasn't troubled you too much. <clears throat> the main thing I want you to know is that overall, the text of the New Testament is fairly reliable. What I've highlighted today are some of the exceptions. Um, so basically, just know that text critics work really, really hard. There are teams of some of the most intelligent people in the entire world who pay attention to all of these details that I'm bringing to your attention, and they deliver to your Greek critical editions, their best and most educated and um, measured judgment on what they think the text is. They're not going to say we found the original text. They have let go of that. They're saying we are doing our best to find the earliest circulating text, and they're giving that to us for our use in the churches, while also saying we can't be certain what the author wrote all the time. But most of the time, we're pretty, like, you know, 95% of the time we know, like this is, or maybe even 98% of the time, we are okay. We know what, what the author wrote here. It's, you know, the, va the variations are mostly changes of word order or synonyms, or, you know, there's an accidental slip. That's the vast majority of, of the changes. I've just, I've just called to your attention the most, some of the most important ones that do kind of affect the outcome of how we interpret our New Testament. 
My own work centers. Um, thus far, I have worked a lot on John chapter 11, which we'll be talking about next week, and John chapter 20, which is the encounter between Jesus and Mary Magdalene in the garden. My dissertation actually is going to be writing about dozens of these sorts of problems. Um, but uh, we'll be talking next week about John 11 and the week after that, John 20. So I am now open for questions. And I think we have a little bit of time left, maybe 10 minutes left. Um, we've just been uh, finished a study on Acts mm. uh, in this time. And um, I wonder, if you would the the western text or visa mm -hmm. text of acts is substantially different uh yes. from the the uh other big textual families so i'm yes. wondering if you uh, have any uh, what you would comment on that well i my work centers in the gospels and part of the reason that i've done that is precisely because the text of Acts is so problematic. Um, I mentioned briefly Codex Beze, which was copied around 400 AD. It's a diglot manuscript. It means it has both a Greek and a Latin side. And it's it's wildly different in, in many parts from what the Greek text is. And some of the other old Latin manuscripts that I was talking about have a very different text of the book of Acts. And it's not just the old Latin and Codex Beze. You also get some Coptic manuscripts that match it, and even some certain parts found in um, a couple of other later Greek manuscripts. So the Western text is actually one of the biggest mysteries in textual criticism. And actually, just hold on for one second, and I'm going to show you something. Um, So uh, that group in Germany that I was telling you about, they tackled the text of the Acts of the Apostles, and they recently came out with an Editio Critico Maior, which contains all of the problems of the text in the Book of Acts. This is their edition of the Book of Acts. It's over a thousand pages long. That's how problematic the text of the Book of Acts is. This is the this is like, it's just the book of Acts, and it's got all the textual variations that you can find throughout the text transmission. The book of Acts is a, is a big problem, and we don't actually know. Probably what, what some people think is that, some people think that Luke had two editions, that Luke wrote one and then revised it, and then a second one started going, but most people also think that the text was just sort of growing and changing, and people had no trouble sort of editing it and changing it in the second century. So it's, it's a really wild textual tradition, the Book of Acts. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, for um, for someone like me who doesn't read Greek or Hebrew and can really only read in English, do you have a recommendation on which English translations of the Bible are, hmm. are reliable or useful or, or helpful? Yes, yes, use a study Bible. That's, uh, you know, there's the, um, this is always a good one, the Harper Collins study Bible. This is a nice one. It's nice and, you know, you can carry it around with you. And um, it's a, a really good study Bible will always have notes. So um, <clears throat> like you'll see here, this is in, uh, well, here's Esther, <laughs> but it says other ancient authorities lack the words to Ethiopia. Okay. That tells you that the manuscripts differ there or um, other ancient authorities lack the word kneeling in the gospel of mark so you, you'll just look for this other ancient authorities add or lack this is a, a really responsible study bible that if you look in the footnotes it'll tell you what the textual variations are are there any particular translations modern translations that are that are useful well um the first thing i want to say is that every translation is an interpretation people always say oh these were inaccurately translated and i'm like no, no, no. It's just that this translator had a different interpretation than that translator. Every translation is an interpretation. So I, I mean, <clears throat> you should just sort of know, like, what other, whatever church you're affiliated with, you can see what the recommended um, Bible translation is for your church. So uh, I'm a member of the Episcopal Church, and we usually use the New Revised Standard Version 
Some more conservative churches use the English Standard Version. There's also the, the New International Version. Um, Catholic churches use the New American Bible. So um, I would just trust whoever, like whatever your church is that you go to, you can just look at the translation that's used by your church. And you will see that certain, like for instance, the English Standard Version, some people get really angry because they'll, they'll be focusing on um, translations that some people think are androcentric. But of course the biblical text is androcentric. Paul will say, my brothers, like brothers, brothers, brothers. But your New Revised Standard Version will translate that as brothers and sisters. Even mm -hmm. though Paul did not use the word sisters in his text, the NRSV purposely translated it as brothers and sisters because that's who Paul meant. Paul meant brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. so, there, so is that accurate? I mean, some people would say that's not what Paul said, but it is what Paul meant. So, <laughs> so um, I would say, I mean, I use the NRSV because I'm an Episcopalian, but the New American Bible is a good Catholic translation and different denominations use different translations. Thank you. Yeah. A comparison that a few of you may have heard me make decades ago is imagine if for people who live in the U.S., the oldest surviving copy that we had of the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution dated from the middle of the Civil War or some horrible period of failed mm. construction. And I was sharing this observation before such entities like the Federalist Society and originalism at the Supreme Court make it even scarier. Mm. But uh, that's a, an interesting context I liked today how you pointed out how there were controversies in the church mm -hmm. at the time you know we frequently we, we think about church history on one hand and the text is a fixed object on the other but one thing you said today I, I had frequently thought of the differences as being copyist errors that you know you look at text a and text b and they differ but you pointed out where there are cross outs and erasures by a given scribe, mm -hmm. the thought crossed my mind, are there any instances where some of this might be viewed as vandalism? You know, a different color of ink, I'd sort of doubt there's any way to say, oh, this got scratched out 200 years after it was written. Well, we'll talk about that next week. <laughs> Next week, I'll, I'll be talking about a possible instance of that. Um, by the way, I wanted to say what an incredible analogy that is that you said about the Declaration of Independence. We do, I believe, have the original copy of the Declaration of Independence. We have the autograph, which is great. Imagine if we didn't have the autograph and a copy from, as you said, you know, 100 years later or 200 years later, and they all differed from one another. <laughs> How would you reconstruct what the original said? You would have to know what the controversies were at the time and try to sort of, I might use that analogy if I have your permission. That's such a great analogy. You would try to say, well, we know these were the conversations that people were having at the time of this copy. And so you try to say, well, which one do we trust? You kind of go back to the one before it that is the one that would have been changed. Um, as for the, you know, and actually there's this text critical rule, um, the most like trust the, re the reading that is, the, the most difficult reading is the one to be preferred. Prefer the most difficult reading because that's the one that people would have changed. They would have changed the version that was the most difficult to handle. So a lot of times this maxim of textual criticism is go with the most difficult reading. Um, and yes, there are instances, I mean, some people would say that the Johannine comma is vandalism. And it's in the vast majority, it's like in nearly all of the Latin manuscripts. They've said, mm -hmm. somebody has altered this text, they've made it say what they want it to say in the fourth century, they want a Trinitarian doctrine. <clears throat> you could say that that's, but scribes are human. Copyists are human, editors are human. And um, so this, our manuscript tradition is an interaction between, it's a human encounter with the divine, you could say. Just uh, uh, one or two more things. Uh, the longer ending of Mark mm -hmm. uh, is the fact, if you read that ending, it has the passage about how followers of Jesus will pick up snakes and <laughs> 
yeah. not be harmed. Mm -hmm. And in that text that really is not in the original, uh, is not early, uh, it becomes the foundation for the snake handling cults yes. in yes. Appalachia today. Yes. Uh, so there, there's, yeah, there can be some bad theology in uh, text criticism. The other thing, Elizabeth, I want, if, if we found an autograph, how would we know it's the autograph? Good point. We wouldn't. We wouldn't actually know. But if it were something that was dated to the first century, supposedly we could figure that out paleographically. Um, but not, I mean, but all of these manuscripts, like the oldest ones, like Papyrus 66 at Cod and Codex Vaticanus, um, they are mostly dated paleographically, which is an inexact science. I mean, there might be some people today whose handwriting is similar to the way that people wrote it 100 years ago. And then you would you would accidentally date it to the um, 20th century when it really should be dated to the 21st century, right? Like paleographic dating is inexact. It's an, it's an inexact science. So we don't actually know always what the dating is. But um, if something were like... That first fragment I showed you, Papyrus 52, its handwriting style is older. It's more of a second century handwriting style than any of the other copies we have of the New Testament. So basically we're basing it on the handwriting. And um, some handwriting style is a little older and that's the best we can do. I wanted to make sure that people in the room in Westbrook got a, I know we're past time, but if, if there was anybody in Westbrook that had a question. In the root language, study the text in the root languages. In diverse languages. The root languages. The root languages. Greek is the root. Greek is the language of composition. Okay. So did you study the, the text in Greek? Or... Yes, I mostly study the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Yes, um, the vast majority of textual criticism is done in Greek. Um, but at the very, just that little tag I put on at the end are the versional manuscripts. I hope I understood your question. It was a little difficult to hear. The vast majority of the work that I do, I don't look at, I don't look at Bible translations for my work. I look at the manuscripts in their copy language, which is the ones I was showing you at the beginning, Papyrus 66, Codex Vaticanus, Papyrus 46, Papyrus 72. Those are all in Greek. And um, I would look at it in Greek. And then I can you speak up just a little bit or maybe go closer to the microphone? Can you hear me now? Yes, that's that's better. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm wondering with the um, I'm wondering with the manuscripts, where you actually like did you actually physically see any of the manuscripts or did you just do research? online to be able to like, all the, the vast majority okay. these days is done online because um, people care about the New Testament and all of these manuscripts have been digitized. I do sometimes work with real manuscripts. Duke has a wonderful collection of Greek manuscripts and I have done some work on the 11th and 12th century Greek gospel manuscripts held by Duke. Like the one that I showed you with the last page of John chapter 21. Uh, sorry, with the last page of John has the story of the woman caught in adultery. I have held and looked at that manuscript. Um, but, you know, the vast majority, like you can't travel all over the world, like Papyrus 66, nobody gets to look at it because it's so fragile. Codex Washingtonianus is at the, Papyrus 66 is in Geneva. Uh, the Freer Gospels are at the Smithsonian and they just put them in a vault. And they took pictures, really good pictures, and then they hide them. Nobody gets to look at them because the more time you spend with them, the more the manuscript might deteriorate. So the, the vast majority of work today is done with really high-end digital photographs. Thank you. Elizabeth, you are so fortunate to have those manuscripts uh, available to you online. Just yeah. we didn't have anything like that when I was I know. Uh, coming through. So. It's a new age, absolutely. Before everybody had to rely on critical editions or occasionally a really nice um, sort of like printed facsimile of Codex Sinaiticus, like the best manuscripts might get a facsimile that you could peek at.
but these days, yeah, the fact that you can look at every single page um, online is, it's a real blessing and it, it in some ways can revolutionize textual criticism that just anybody can go to a website and look at the manuscripts. Any other questions? Um, I wanted to uh, offer if anybody has further questions, hopefully you can see um, my email is elizabeth.schrader at duke.edu. I, I just got married, so now I have a third, oops, another last name, but my email address is still elizabeth.schrader at duke.edu. So if there's something that you, that occurs to you later that you want to ask about, you can just send me an email and I will um, be happy to respond. And I'll also be here next week and the week after talking about some textual problems in John 11 and John 20. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank Thanks you. so much to all of you. Thank you to Nelson for setting it up. We look forward to next week. Yep. All right. Yep. See you all next week. Bye. Thanks, I want to treat.